Hello and welcome to Time for Healing, a show that introduces you to a variety of healing modalities. I'm your host, Marion Porter of Starwinds. If you want to find out more information about me, check out my website at starwindshealing.com. And now it's time for healing. <laughs> Our guest today is John Rowe of Conscious Connecticut. Today we are going to discuss a little history of the healing community in Connecticut. So, John, I am so excited to have you on my very first show. This is like a dream come true. And when I thought about this show, I couldn't think of anybody to have as my first guest but you. Thank you very much. Glad yeah. to be here. <laughs> great, great. So, you've been following and promoting holistic health since 1985. When and how did you first get interested? I was first drawn to the area more through the metaphysical type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked at Pratt & Whitney as an engineer uh, for 32 years, cool which always that? surprises people because how did you get into yeah, this? Yeah, exactly. But we'll go through all that. But, but um, I took my first class back in 1976 in the local adult high school. It was supposedly on holistic health, but really it was a much broader thing, which introduced me to the whole area of metaphysics. So being an engineer, I was very skeptical about a lot of this stuff, but I like to experiment. Um, at the time, I was relatively healthy, young guy, um, but I had uh, you know a few ailments and things like that. So I started playing with some of the things, and one of the most important things I probably learned from the early books was the power of the mind. Mm -hmm. and how we program ourselves to get sick. Uh, one interesting example is I used to get quite a few colds when I was younger. And um, what I learned was my mother, um, with the best of intentions, had said, if you, if you step in a wet thing or step in a rain, you're going to catch a cold. If you're in a draft, you're going to catch a cold. These things. And I didn't realize it, but this was sending a message to my subconscious. Uh -huh. And the subconscious is like a, like a computer, it, it, and this is a program was being written. And once I discovered the programs and said I don't have to do this anymore, I gradually got better and better, and I went for 10 years at Pratt without catching anything, a perfect tendence type of thing. So, <laughs> so the power of the mind was the first thing for me. Um, then um, after five years of kind of reading and studying, I took another class, and then that got me much more involved. And then, of course, once I got into the door opener, then I began meeting a lot of people and learning more about the whole area. So that's sort of how I got started. Where were you taking these classes? Um, when you're getting started in this stuff, you don't know what kind of weirdos are out there. Yeah. And you're not going to go to their houses. So I took them at the uh, local high school adult ed. Really? Because that's safe. That's a safe place to get started, and it's still true. There's still a lot of these introductory courses on either metaphysics or health or something like that. You can take it at the adult ed and kind of dip your toe in gradually and see how it feels, which, which I recommend. You, you know, you got to feel comfortable. With. Wow. So the door opener. What what led you to the door opener? Because I remember, I remember <laughs> reading that way back in the day and loving that. Um, when I started again in 1981 and really started to get involved with the community, um, I had trouble finding out what was going on around. I didn't know what was going on. There were in those days no bookstores, um, no centers that were out of people's homes. Um, it, was, it was difficult to find how to tap into the community. Um, I went to a, uh, like a little fair uh, celebration for life which you, it was a, a going away for a weekend type of thing where you got to meet a lot of people. I got very excited about it and volunteered to help the next year, and that kind of drew me in. That was Bev Titus and uh, Elizabeth Eisenhower, who were still active in the area. And they had been in the field for a long time, so they brought me in and taught me. And I kept looking for how I could give back, because I had totally changed myself over that 10 years from an introverted, shy uh, person who really didn't care much for himself to more or less what I am today, blab blabbermouth and very excited about this stuff. So I was looking for what I might do and I, you know, do I want to be a teacher, some kind of reader, some kind of healer and nothing felt right. And after we had done the last 1986 celebration of life, uh, one of the people working with us was doing a magazine called the New Age Exchange and that included some local things in it. But she wanted to go national 
with her magazine. So it got smaller and smaller and smaller. So she came to our little group, which was called An Open Door, and said, uh, will you guys want to pick this up? And so I just kind of knew that that was what was there for me. Um, as an engineer, I had the you know, logical, I can plan things out, skills, and lay them out, and I can write a little bit and things like that. So I said, okay, I'll do it if you guys will help me. So that was kind of where it got started back in the uh, fall of 1986. It started out very small. And the concept was that we would mostly focus on what was going on so we could show people what was going on. So that's sort of how it got started. It was also about the same time as um, some of the bookstores were, were coming into focus. Uh, Viewpoints, Marie Cornelius Viewpoints yes, started then. Yes, I used to then. go there. Agnetas came along oh, a couple years yeah. later, and they were starting to sprout up around the state, so there's places to distribute the, well, new, more of a newsletter in those days than a magazine. Wow. So so back to this celebration of life. What, what part of the state was this in, and is that where you would think the community, if you were to look at a place where the community started, would that be about the place? It's kind of where it took off. Uh -huh. uh, Beverly Titus, uh, who had been active for probably a good 10 years in, in the community at the time, um, went to Maine to uh, Maine Whole Health Festival or something like that they called it. And she just got very excited about it and she came back to Connecticut and said, we could do that here. And she talked it up with some of her friends, Don Hayes um, and a lot of other people that were active at the time. And they said, sure, we'll be glad to help you. And she had no idea she was going to run it, but she did for three years. And we went to um, a children's camp south of Willimannock. And um, I, I just went to the first one, but the next two I would be part of the group putting it on. Mm -hmm. And they had to go in there and clean up the latrines and clean up everything because it hadn't opened for the season yet. So they got us to, to clean the whole place up. And then people came in and stayed for uh, three nights and four days. And we just had a wonderful time. You had all the best teachers, uh, best healers, best readers in the state. And we uh, brought a, set up a bookstore in there. We had um, some fairly well-known at the time groups come in each night for, with music. So it was just, for me, I'd never had any kind of experience this high before. It was like a very natural high. No drugs or alcohol, absolutely not there. It was part of the rules. And you just got high on life. It was just so much fun. You know, just wanted more, so I was hooked at that point. Wow, that's that's. It was exciting. What year was that? Eighty six. Eighty four was 84? the first one. Oh. Eighty five and eighty six. So Bev did three, and then she says, "I'm not going to do any more. Anybody else want to take over?" And nobody put their hand up. So that was the end of it. So this was the first of its kind thing that ever happened in Connecticut. I believe so. Yeah, first thing that big. It uh, brought a lot of us in contact with each other. Uh, it, it kind of. Um, created a community there. I'm sure there were other communities around the state, but that was my first active one. And so I, I, it was very exciting. Met a lot of people, had a lot of fun, learned a lot. So, so if that's where the community started, so you had, you had the door opener where you were. That came out after that, yeah. Okay, and, and then, then there were the bookstores. What, what caused the big growth in, in, in all of this in, in the state or in the uh, one, one of the things I think that really caused the boom in the late 80s was technology. Um, computers were just coming into their own. The internet was still a few years down the road, but a small publication like The Door Opener with very little money and um, you know, kind of a do-it-yourself, you do everything type of thing could put together a magazine um, on, a, on the simple computers at a time, which you know was good enough. Uh, you had to word processing things, and you could put it out on a dot matrix printer, take it to the printer, and you could create a magazine with minimum money. So I, th I think that was taking off at the time. So we did that, and other magazines were starting to come through then. And so um, it was just easier to get the word out and communicate with this. Uh, again, it was before internet and before email, but it, it was a start. Fascinating. So we, we got to live through that evolution. Um, as we went along and the technology got better, um, the magazine got larger and got a little fancier. And then in 96, we went online with it. We put it online. That was pretty early, actually. It's almost 20 years ago. So that was early for getting the magazine and things online. I did love looking at those issues of the door opener. I, but, but you know, that's when, because I, I was at UConn around mm -hmm. then, all right? I, I, I went to UConn around 84, 85 semester. Mm -hmm. And 
soon I would start seeing the door open. I, I loved it. And it we would look at that and we would find all kinds of things to do. It was like, it was kind of all we had unless we had word of mouth stuff. Mm -hmm. yep. And then all the different shops opened up. Yep. And then we'd be going to all kinds of events. I, I wish I was there for... You would have loved it. You oh would have absolutely God. loved it. Yeah. I, I wish I was there for that. Um, <coughs> okay, so, so then... <coughs> You went on to, to do the New Age Guild of Connecticut. So. Yeah, that, that was probably the next thing that came along in 1989, and that was the um, idea of a numerologist by the name of Pam Bell at the time. And there had been some problems with some psychic readers who weren't as honest as you'd like them to be. Uh, uh, you could get shady people and all rotten apples and all sorts of things. And so she wanted to kind of uh, find some way to bring respectability to the field. There was also at the time on the books a fortune telling law, which back back to the early 1800s. A fortune telling law? A fortune telling law. law. Uh, the original law included astrologers and what would you call psychotherapists. We're all considered psychotherapists. Sick a psychotherapists. Well, a well They're all fringe, field. fringe wackos. Okay, <laughs> uh, and this is the early 1800s, and there's a lot of other type of things thrown into this law. Some of them had been removed along the way. The psychotherapists got their part changed, and the um, astrologers got out of it. But it still was there, and um, it hung over people's heads. And it was sometimes enforced by local police. Uh, if they'd gotten a complaint, they would show up and shut down a New Age fair, for example, or maybe arrest a, one particular psychic here or there. Does actually happen? Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a good story there if you want me to go into I it. Do. Okay. I do. I really the, do. There is um, in West Hartford a tarot reader who was an accountant and very, um, very solid citizen, and she read tarot cards. Um, for Mother's Day, the current was doing unusual gifts, and they, uh, she was one of the ones, you know, if, uh, here's, here's something you could do to take your mother to for something unusual for Mother's Day. Well, the police saw that, and they sent two um, undercover cops there as husband and wife, and had her do a reading, and then arrested her. And this poor, um, you know, very upstanding accountant, uh, was, you know, put in cuffs and hauled off. I can't imagine that. <laughs> and and um, Igor Sikorsky, the son of Igor Sikorsky, who started the plant and is a lawyer and mm -hmm. is still comes to some of our events. He's older now. But he defended her, and it was a very, went to trial, and it was a fascinating trial, and she was found not guilty. But it made us want to overturn the fortune-telling law, which... The New Age Guild was one of the projects we did. Uh, we and others from around the state got together, and we had a, a fun time um, going in front of the legislature and testifying. You'd be, there'd be 50, 20 of us there testifying, and they got tired of hearing us and whatever. But anyway, it, it passed very nicely. What year was this? This was, a, I think, 89. It was 89. Oh. So that was fun. So the New Age Guild did that. So it was intended to be a better business bureau and a chamber of commerce. And at the time, there was no holistic health practitioner groups in the greater Hartford area, so that became part of what we did. So a lot of what we did was educational. Uh, we had monthly meetings of different types. Sometimes there'd be one speaker. Sometimes we did something called round robins. Um, we would have maybe six people set up around the room and there'd be 15 minute sessions and you would learn about different modalities. Uh, you might get to sample some or you might just hear about it. So you'd go from one to the other and, and it was a way to learn something about holistic health and kind of, in a way, meet the practitioners. So that was one of the many things we did. So, so holistic health, just, just, just to, to <clears throat> describe it, if you, if you could just, what's your definition of um, holistic health? It's whole person, I think, is one way to look at it. We talk about the whole person being mind, body, mind, and spirit, but it's also whole life and lifestyle. So it includes what do you eat, um, what's your social network, what is the environment that you work in, are you under a lot of stress. So it's all aspects of the person. Uh, it, it, if you, it, as opposed to allopathic or Western medicine, where if you go to a doctor, they're going to probably treat the symptom mm -hmm. and, and resolve that without looking at what might be the overall problem, which could be a stress issue, could be you know, kind of garbage you're eating, which reduces your immune system. 
Um, so a holistic practitioner is going to look at, and it depends on what their modality is, uh, more of the big picture, so to speak. And they're going to try to bring your life into balance, whether it's through through what you eat or whatever, and it's there's a mental component to it type of thing. Um, they try to bring you to a point of maximum well-being, whatever that means. Uh -huh. Might not mean totally healthy, but it depends on where you are and what's going on. But right. they'll they'll maximize that. Another key part of it to me is that you take responsibility for your own health. It's your body, it's your health. Don't hand it all over to a medical person and go out, eat, drink, and be merry, get sick, and go to the doctor and say, here, fix me. Uh, doctor is your partner, uh, an advisor, and you work together to come up with a, you know, a plan of treatment. But it's your ultimately responsibility and you take it. It's a very empowering step for people to take. Mm. Uh, you go to, a, to somebody in the Western community, they may, may want you to you know, give them your, your power, and then you know, it's, it's not the same. It, it's a very important way of taking your power back. That's a great way to put it. <laughs> okay, so, so you were talking about these round robins and the different modalities that were available. What, what, was, what was on the scene back then? Um, actually, many of those or most of the same ones that are there today. The major ones, naturopathy, chiropractic, acupuncture, massage, energy work. Um, they were all there. There may have been a few modalities you don't see much anymore. Rebirthing, uh, still around, yeah. but it, you don't see it much anymore. Um, Neuro-linguistic programming, which it's, it's a very interesting one, uh, which you don't hear that much about anymore. So most of the basic things were there. You just didn't know about them and didn't know how to find out about them before they started coming out with directories, which was one of the main things the practitioner groups did. Uh, when, and, and there were very few people doing some of these. In around 1989, I decided I wanted to try this Reiki stuff and I wanted to take a class in Reiki. Nobody lived in Connecticut taught Reiki. In 1989? In 89. Oh my God, you shake a tree and Reiki practitioners have fallen there down. There were three people that would come into the state periodically and do Reiki classes. Uh, I got a few people together and we brought a guy, John Gray, who's very well known from the old days, mm -hmm. down from Boston. He came down from Boston and you know, to my home and taught us Reiki there. So it just gives you an idea how, how the community has changed and well, it changed in 10 years and now it's 25 years later from then. Yeah. No, no Reiki nope. in 1989 no, Nobody in state in taught Reiki in Connecticut. And so, so it was thin, the, there, there were the modalities here, but they were very thin and it was very hard to find what they were. That's, that's unbelievable to yeah. me. Because I mean, look now, if you were to look in the door opener or some of the other publications every weekend, <coughs> Every weekend is a Reiki class somewhere. Um, you can take it at Manchester Community College. You can take a full, full course of Reiki. Well, and most of the hospitals so they take, have, yes, have, have, have a Reiki They're, program. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. So, so a lot has changed over the following 10 years. There were huge changes. Okay. So, so from 1989 to now, because now, I mean. Yeah. Even that just the next 10 years was when things started to take off. What, what, do you, what, what do you think? The trigger, I think, was uh, a MD by the name of David Eisenberg, I think I got that right, uh, from Harvard. Very highly respected man did a survey of who's using um, alternative complementary techniques and products. And he uh, found that, I think, I think it was 30 to 40 percent of the people were doing something. That included taking like vitamins and supplements. But he also monetized the number and um, said how many billions of dollars people are spending out of pocket because this wasn't covered on these things, showing that there was a huge interest and a lot of money in flow. So that kind of woke up the medical establishment and they're going, whoa, um, we need to tap into this. It was kind of funny in the mid 90s as the hospitals got involved. Um, both Hartford Hospital and St. Francis started integrative medicine departments and their marketing departments were tripping all over each other trying to show that, that they did more of it than the other hospital. They, were, they competed over who had the most, they wouldn't have called the holistic health, but integrative medicine was the term they liked. Okay. Um, 
In some respects, it was lip service, and uh, you know what was actually provided was kind of thin, but they saw the benefit of it. And then, of course, the um, supplement manufacturers started to ramp up. There were more supplement stores open. There were some chains came along, and it started really ramping up. Uh -huh. A second thing happened to legitimize the whole thing. The National Institutes of Health, which is big Washington-based uh, grant funding group, started a um, complementary and integrative medicine uh, CAM um, section, which had grant money. Started very small, but they had respectable doctors running it, uh, who would give grants out to test the benefits of acupuncture on stress or acupuncture on breaking something or yoga, uh, yo uh, benefits of yoga and stress reduction, um, tai chi, a particular kind of herb on something. So they were doing documented studies that they could point to and say, see, this works. So it was the hospitals, you're saying? This at this point was the National Institutes of Health, which also would study, this, this is a huge deal in Washington, been there for a long time. Uh, they would, they would um, handle a lot of funding on things like uh, oh, the cancers and things like that. Oh. So say they were very big, very respected. They did a lot of the independent neutral studies of different uh, approaches to healing things. Mm -hmm. So when they finally put in a complementary alternative medicine section, that was a big deal. Started small, was successful, and it grew, grew, grew. I think that started in 98. And that legitimized things. Another thing that was happening during that period was uh, some of the uh, groups were getting licensed that hadn't been licensed before. Uh, massage therapists got licensed sometime in the 90s. Acupuncturists got licensed someplace in the 90s. So this isn't all that long ago that things started well, getting 15, to be... 20 years now, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, time flies fast. Wow, so, so we're, we're almost out of time. What, okay. I, what I really wanna, I wanna touch on now is, sure. okay, so we had the National Institute of Health, and so, so we had a little bit of legitimacy coming. So, so now, from that point to now, there's, there's a whole host of modalities that I'll be covering on this show, but yep. how, do you, how do we go from the blow up to now everywhere there's, go, going, there's all kinds Going very of, quickly. Yeah. <laughs> During the 90s, a lot of small um, practitioner groups sprang up. Uh, each state kind of had, or each uh, major city had one. Um, Greater Hartford Holistic Health Association started in about 94 in Hartford. It grew over the next five years to become the Connecticut Holistic Health Association and absorbed some of the other groups. I won't go into a lot of detail there, but we were able to work with the Connecticut Hospital Association on some joint conferences. So we began to get in. Um, the hospitals got more familiar with us, and each of these groups put out directories of some sort so people could find us. Then they went on the internet and um, started to spread from there. A door opener got bigger and bigger. There was other publications came in. So it just kind of kept, kept flowing. Yeah, because now, I, you know, I mean, I'm a practitioner myself, and I know a lot, a lot of people in, in the field. There's practitioners mm -hmm. everywhere, many who will be on this show. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, the Internet made everything accessible. Now you can go check things out. You can get information, email, emails back and forth. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. yeah. But that was slow in coming. Fascinating. Fascinating history. You know, I, 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 I didn't know about the fortune teller law thing, so that, that's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. And just, just how everything just, well, the fact that there was no Reiki here in 1989, that alone, yeah. the whole field has just blown up completely to <laughs> where we're all out there everywhere uh, doing our thing. Yep, there's lots of opportunities now. Uh, a, a lot of choices. It's wonderful. Well, you know what? Thank you so much for, for being me. on this show. This was this this show is is a long time dream of mine. And, Good. And that that we've actually gotten through the first show. <laughs> it's it's absolutely fabulous. Thank you for sharing all of your knowledge and all the the history on all of this. So thank you for watching. We had a great time with John Rowe learning a little history of the healing community in Connecticut. Please join us next time when we continue this discussion with Dora Dzinski of the Door Opener Magazine.
Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.